In recent months, all around the world we have been witnessing unprecedented uprisings. Crowds of tens if not hundreds of thousands of people marching in protest of intolerable political and economic systems. In many cases, the responses of state forces have been brutal and uncompromising. When we see a phenomenon repeat itself in such a large-scale manner, we must start asking questions. What has caused this mobilization, and why now? What can we learn from these movements, and what should we expect to see in the world in the coming years? This video will attempt to compare and analyze several major movements in order to answer those questions. For our purposes, we will be looking at Chile, Haiti, Ecuador, Argentina, Iraq, and Lebanon. Each of these countries has been paralyzed by massive waves of resistance in the last two months. To begin with, we will look at a brief summary of the nature and context of each country's protests. Once we get a solid overview of each country, we will consider a comparative analysis. Chile's is yet another story of the promised prosperity for all being a blatant lie. Despite the success of the Chilean economy, most of the people in the country have not seen an improvement in the standard of living. On the contrary, economic hardship has become a fact of life for too many people, all while the wealthy benefit from the current system. Chile is often seen as a poster child of capitalist development. After far-right dictator Pinochet attempted to eradicate all traces of leftist resistance and implement free market policies. Bringing in CIA-backed economists, Chile transformed itself into the ideal neoliberal playground. The austerity measures put in place during the economic restructuring in the late 20th century gave free reign to the market, constricting the role of the government to the smallest possible size. Such policies did exactly what they were designed to do, create wealth but not distribute it. The Chilean protests began as a student-organized response to government proposed increases in transportation fares. The government announcement was met with a fare evasion campaign in which students jumped over turnstiles to avoid paying transportation fees. Interestingly enough, in the proposed policy, the students were to remain largely unaffected, meaning that the action was a message from the Chilean youth that they were ready to defend other segments of the population. Indeed, Chile students have a long history of initiating social and political movements in response to unpopular government plans. Police repression of the earlier protests only fueled the movement forward, which in turn triggered the deployment of the military. What started out as a resistance to increased transportation fees grew into a full-fledged condemnation of the entire economic system in Chile. On the 24th of October, a general strike was called in spite of the government's proposed reforms. The strike included students, copper workers, teachers, healthcare workers, and others. The following day, on the 25th of October, over a million people marched in protest of austerity, inequality, and the Piñera administration, completely freezing the capital city in Chile. The size of this demonstration was unlike anything seen in decades, not since the people took to the streets in defiance of the Pinochet regime. The tone of Chile's leader has shifted drastically from denigrating the student-led evasion actions to acknowledging the country's problems and promising change. In response to the strength of the protest on the 25th of October, President Piñera has fired his whole cabinet. Much like in Chile, the situation in Haiti represents a certain tipping point that seems to have escalated opposition beyond the precedent of the past several years. Haiti has been dealing with crippling infrastructural problems, massive unemployment, rampant poverty, power outages, corruption, and a painful brain drain. Haiti has been at the heart of many powerful movements in history, including a slave rebellion that initiated the end of slavery in the New World. Unfortunately, the bravery of the Haitian people has not saved them from a horrible string of occupation, exploitation, and dictatorship. Colonized initially by the French, Haiti was also subject to later occupation by the US military, and of course the exploitation of its economy by US banks and businesses. After the formal removal of foreign influence from the country, the Haitians suffered at the hands of numerous dictators, many of whom received support from the US. In more recent history, the end of the Petro Caribe deal from Venezuela created a dire situation for the Haitian economy. The Petro Caribe project was started by Venezuela to provide cheap fuel to neighboring countries. The extra revenue from this deal was supposed to go towards a fund that helped develop the infrastructure and the economy of the country. However, much of the money that was supposed to be coming in from this development package, which came out to a whopping $2 billion, has disappeared. Most observers believe that the money was consumed entirely by the corrupt political elite. The end of the Petro Caribe program has also met massive fuel shortages which have been crippling the country. To make matters worse, the Moise government proposed a cut to government fuel subsidies. 
which was expected to raise the price of fuel astronomically. This cut was part of the austerity conditions laid out by the IMF, which offered a low interest loan in exchange for the new policies. The government has been paying market prices for fuel from US oil companies, instead of receiving the discounted price from Venezuela. Fuel shortages have meant that schools and hospitals cannot remain operational, and personal residences cannot stay powered for long periods of time. With unemployment at a shocking 70% and inflation at 20%, recent government proposals to cut fuel subsidies were met with violent outrage. Having practically nothing to lose, the Haitian people flooded the streets and are now demanding an end to the current regime, as well as to austerity measures which have been crippling the country for decades. Ecuador's movement began on October 3rd when the government announced the end of gasoline subsidies. The protests quickly escalated into a broad rejection of austerity politics and the neoliberal government. As is the case in our previous examples, poverty rates have been going up in Ecuador in recent years. The fuel subsidy cut would have been a devastating final blow for many struggling people. The attack on public services and social protections has sparked fury among groups who struggle in the current economic environment. In an absolutely tone-deaf move, President Moreno's administration proposed a massive cut to public projects and employment, as well as moves to privatize key sectors of the economy. The Moreno administration was aware in advance that it would probably need violence to implement further austerity policies in the country. The result was a bloody repression of the activists. This, of course, did not stop the movement from marching on the government. The protesters, mostly driven by organized indigenous groups, oppose austerity measures, IMF economic demands, and subsequent increases in the price of basic goods. Many Marxist groups have also taken part in the protests, given their historical ties to indigenous populations and unions. The crowds are joined by feminist organizations who are fighting for abortion rights and share similar sentiments with the indigenous people about economic reforms. The government has sought to negotiate with groups in succession as a strategy designed to fragment the movement into distinct demographics. By all accounts, the Moreno administration has backed down on its original proposals, which sparked the protests. It remains to be seen if the government will attempt to reintroduce austerity policies as it struggles to meet the requirements of the IMF so that it can secure a multi-billion dollar loan. If the pattern isn't already becoming evident, the case of Argentina will spell it out for us once again. Argentina has seen a recent history of unemployment and food insecurity, followed by proposals to cut crucial public spending and expand privatization efforts. Like Ecuador, Argentina hopes to secure IMF funds by taking the so-called bitter medicine of fiscal austerity. The IMF has asked the government in Buenos Aires to make much-needed cuts in spending, and in return the country will receive money from the international organization. Anger towards the regime has been accumulating since it came to power in the last election in 2015. Many of the government's policies have been a direct attack on the poorest segments of the population. A climbing debt to GDP ratio, massive inflation, and dangerous unemployment forced the Argentine population onto the streets. A massive strike took place on the 25th of September in 2018, which was aimed at the austerity politics being enforced by Macri's government, thanks to the consultation of the IMF. A year later, the demonstrators were on the streets again for the very same reason. Halfway across the world, Iraq is feeling the impact of protests and bloody repression. The protests started after Lt. Gen. al-Sadi, deemed a national hero by many for his integral role in the liberation of Mosul from ISIL, was demoted. This move was seen as a characteristically corrupt decision made by an elite that is absolutely out of touch with the sentiments of the people. Iraq's oil riches have not translated into infrastructural development or even basic needs for the people. Torn apart by civil conflict, occupation, and wars, Iraq is in desperate need of economic justice. Iraqis associate their political elite with either the US or Iranian camps, neither of which have the interests of the people in mind. Iraqis have barely seen the oil money that the country has been raking in. That money mostly finds its way into the pockets of either the domestic elite or their international partners. Many people blame the very constitution of the country for the political incompetence of the current government. The US coalition set in place a sectarian political system that has not been able to accomplish anything during its rule. The state of Iraq's economy and infrastructure has been deteriorating, and the only thing that the government has been able to secure is profits for the elite. The demographics of the protests reflect a fundamental change from previous movements. The struggle today is a spontaneous one, 
coming from angry young working class people who find themselves in an entirely hopeless situation. The protesters started out demanding jobs, water, electricity, and safety. For many, the demands have transformed into a complete overhaul of the political system, so that the many economic problems plaguing the country can be dealt with decisively. The Iraqi protests have been especially tragic, with the government response leading to almost 200 deaths. Iranian-backed militias have been opening fire on the crowds, and many observers have been claiming that snipers were posted around the protest areas. Our last case, Lebanon, carries many of the same themes we've been seeing. A corrupt and detached elite, failing infrastructure, water and power shortages, austerity, unemployment, and poverty. The Lebanese ruling classes, seemingly uninterested in the suffering of the masses, proposed new taxes that were directly harmful to the poorest segments of the population. Much like Iraq, Lebanon never truly recovered from the military conflict that tore through its borders years ago. Though the civil war ended in 1990, the physical and economic damage it left on the population and infrastructure has never been fixed. While the rich got richer, they moved forward with more cuts and more price hikes that drove the rest of Lebanon deeper into economic disrepair. The result has been massive demonstrations unlike anything Lebanon has ever seen. Millions have protested the unbearable conditions. For many observers, the solidarity across regional and religious lines is something completely new to the Lebanese opposition. Unlike previous movements, this uprising did not start in the nexus of legitimate civil society. Instead, the protests have been driven by a disenfranchised, disillusioned, and militant lower class. They have since been joined by many others who have felt the impact of economic and political oppression. The demands are nothing short of regime change. The protesters want a completely new system, one that is based on popular power. The ruling classes have backed down on some tax proposals, but the overall plan forward involves a great deal of austerity and privatization. By now, we are beginning to see some common trends and some terms are becoming increasingly familiar. Though they are feeling it in various degrees, each of these countries are experiencing extreme economic hardship. In simple terms, people are not able to make ends meet. What's more, the proportion of the population that is finding itself in this position is growing. To qualify this first observation, we can add that while a small group of people in these countries is living the good life, most people are not. This is especially frustrating since many of these countries promised their people a decent standard of living, which they were ostensibly going to fund through exploiting the resources that in principle belong to everyone in the country. A third commonality can be found in the merciless austerity being pushed on the shoulders of the masses by the ruling parties. Austerity politics is used to balance the budget, or bring the country back into proper fiscal order. Generally, this involves cuts in spending, and oftentimes deregulation of big industries. Strangely enough, the austerity politics practiced by many governments of the world, and prescribed by the IMF, rarely targets the excesses of the upper echelons of society. When the economy or market is in trouble, the burden is shifted on the working peoples. In combination with the aforementioned issues, this can become a really unpopular tactic. Given these rather obvious problems, which are apparent to most casual observers, why is it that the powers that be continue to pressure their constituents? When we zoom out and connect the dots, the policies of these countries seem like a recipe for disaster. The problem rests in the fact that this tension is a pure manifestation of our system's biggest and most irreconcilable contradiction. The first aspect of this contradiction, the ruling classes or the bourgeoisie, has interests that are absolutely incompatible with the second aspect, the masses. It is entirely possible to find moments in which the contradictory interests of these two poles find a point of solidification, where a balance is struck and the relationship enters a period of relative stability. But at the end of the day, the process by which capital accumulates creates inequality. Mitigating this inequality requires sacrifice on the part of the capitalist coalitions. Sacrifice in the form of profits being limited or redirected towards social funds needed to maintain some semblance of economic justice. This sacrifice comes only when the capitalist class is both willing and able to make it. In the case of the countries we are discussing today, neither condition has been met. The corrupt political and economic elite is neither willing nor able to make concessions to the people. Having become dependent on the sale of one or two commodities for profits, the capitalists dug themselves into a hole when the price of those commodities inevitably fluctuated downward. 
the loss of profit became so great that further revenue needed to be pried out of the working people just to keep the economy afloat. Now, old subsidies and projects need to be cut to keep the private sector competitive, which is a difficult task for many of these countries when their capital meets the capital of much larger and more developed countries on the global market. On the other end of the dialectical relationship, the masses are feeling the pain of economic downturn. They are hit even harder when the few measures put in place to prevent spiraling poverty are removed in a move they are told is necessary evil. For a while the people might bear this burden, but eventually it becomes physically and mentally impossible to live in deteriorating conditions, and the only solution becomes force. For the bourgeois elements, this happens to be through the state and through powerful institutions. For the people, though, the only viable instrument of force is their numbers. And so, the dialectical relationship becomes antagonistic once more. Certainly, it could end once again in a temporary settlement, an entrenchment normally still very much in the favor of the ruling classes, but livable for the people. The conflict between these two contradictory elements will happen infinitely as long as these two elements exist. It could happen in war-torn Iraq, or relatively developed and prosperous Chile. The protests of the past month demonstrate that this relationship will always be at odds. The protests also demonstrate that change may happen incrementally at first, in the form of small quantitative changes. A new fiscal cut here, a reduction in subsidies there, all the while the opposition grows and lashes out periodically. Finally, at a certain point, the antagonism gives birth to a qualitative change. It remains to be seen if such a change will occur in any of the places we spoke of today. Most likely, it will not. Only the complete dissolution of this contradiction, and its two aspects, could be considered a qualitative change in the nature of the societies in question. In other words, only by rendering the two contradictory camps obsolete can you once and for all remove the tension we are seeing today. As a final thought, we should be clear that the contradiction between the capitalist class and the masses is not the only one at work in these events. Within it are the other contradictions that contribute and realign themselves in various ways. Urban versus rural, foreign versus domestic, small business versus working class, nationalist versus internationalist, and so on. These relationships vary in their weight and relative importance to the big picture. In almost all cases, it takes a complex overlap of many of these dialectical structures to produce the kind of rupture we are witnessing today. Undoubtedly, foreign versus domestic interests have played a big role in all the countries on our list, perhaps most of all in Iraq, though in very much a similar way in Lebanon. But it would seem that the principal contradiction is undeniably the one between the capitalist class and the masses. It has created unprecedented unity among groups that did not always exist, and it has clearly dictated the severity with which some of the demonstrations have played out. By the time this video comes out, new developments may call for an updated analysis. The resistance we are seeing now has yet to play out to completion. This is not the first, and it certainly will not be the last such wave. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to leave your thoughts in the comment section below, and until next time, remember, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it.